Jen and Cam are two funny ladies who like to talk about murder, mass murder, murder suicide, serial killers, spree killers, thrill killers, contract killings, honor killings, and a whole lot of other shit. Too heinous for me to list here. If you're disturbed by this sort of content, you may want to listen to something else. And if you're a child trying to listen to our true crime podcast, well, you better ask your mama. My name is Mike Morford. Some of you may know me as co-host of the podcast Criminology. I'd like to tell you about a solo podcast that I host, which is very close to my heart. It's called The Murder of My Family. We've all heard about horrible murder cases in the news, both solved and unsolved. Most of the time, we listen for a moment and then go about our daily routine. But have you ever wondered who those murder victims were or thought about their backgrounds? They're more than a blurb in the news or a statistic. They were real people living real lives. They were someone's child, parent, sibling, or friend. In The Murder of My Family, I try to get to know those victims with the help of the people that knew them best, their family members. Together, we talk about the lives and tragic deaths of their loved ones, as well as the ripple effect the murderers had on surviving friends and family. Some of the episodes feature high-profile cases you're probably familiar with, like the Colonial Parkway murders, the Delphi murders, or the Golden State Killer murders. But many other cases are ones from small towns all over America that barely made the news. There are dozens of episodes of The Murder of My Family available right now to binge on. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm really pretty doing well. I couldn't get <laughs> Except that with your grammar. Out. Yeah, I just couldn't. I was going to say I'm doing pretty good. And then I was going to say I'm doing pretty well. And then it just uh, went your south. Brain, your yeah. brain mixed up those wires and you became a grammar girl, right? right? That's right. Uh-huh. That's right. That's right. So well, uh, awesome. I've got a little uh, a little thing here. It's got a little thing. This, this, what we're about to discuss has always bothered me. So that's, we're going to talk about it right now, right here Let's today. Let's do it. Let's All do right? it. Let's do it. I'm ready. Let me put my seatbelt on. Hold on. Buckle up. Buttercup. Okay. Ready? I'm ready. Yep. Situated in the middle of a wild and beautiful outdoor playground, the town of Smithers, British Columbia, Canada, rests at the foot of the luminous Hudson Bay Mountain. The town is located halfway between Prince George and Prince Rupert along the 450-mile Evergreen-lined Highway 16. Currently, most of the inhabitants of Smithers are of European descent. The First Nations people, notably the Wet'suwet'en, called this land home for thousands of years. Now, only about 8% of the current population are First Nation people. And even though the entire area of the Buckley Valley is untamed, wild, and peacefully scenic, there is another darker side of the valley. Along Highway 16, there are billboards with the following writing. Girls don't hitchhike on the Highway of Tears. Killer on the loose. Or killers. We don't know. Ramona Lisa Wilson, age 16, a member of the Gitz Anne a member of the Gitz Ann Nation was looking forward to going to a dance with several of her friends on a cool, calm evening in June of 1994. Before she headed out that night, she had a dinner of takeout lasagna with her family and watched some television. Ramona, known as the responsible one among her friends, that was, that was me, by the way. <laughs> was it? Uh, that was the responsible was it? one. No. Mm, really? Uh, uh, hey, let me dream. So Ramona, known as the responsible one among her friends, was a treasure to her family, a true miracle child, born late to her mother Matilda, long after she'd given up hope of having any more children. Ramona was athletic, she was always willing to help, and held a job as a dishwasher at a local pancake house called Smitty's. She loved her culture and wrote many poems reflecting that love, and she wanted to be the first person in her family to go to university and become a psychologist. Ramona, wearing a purple sweatshirt, leggings, and pink and white high-top sneakers, headed out the door between 9 and 10 p.m. on that night to meet with a friend. Matilda said her daughter was supposed to meet with her best friend, Crystal. The school year was winding down, and there were all sorts of graduation parties, barbecues, and dances in the area. But that night, Ramona was headed to Hazleton, 46 miles north of Smithers on Highway 16. Along the way to Hazleton 
was a town called Morristown. Now, Hazleton and Morristown are First Nation, are First Nation villages. That's where Ramona's boyfriend lived. If Ramona couldn't catch a ride with somebody heading in that direction, hitchhiking with a stranger was the default mode of transportation. Mm-mm. Now, this is why hitchhiking is very popular. There's very limited public transportation in the town, and none that would take any person the distance of 45 miles. There's a train that makes a schedule stop in Smithers about three times a week in each direction. Uh, there is the BC Bus North. They make a stop in town twice a week. Otherwise, there's a transit system made up of two passenger buses that run a minimal route in and around Smithers. And since it's not free, it kind of makes it cost prohibited, cost prohibited to some of the residents. And Smithers is so far north that the sun doesn't set until almost 10 p.m. at this time of year. And June 21st, which is the longest day of the year, the sun sets then at 10, 10 p.m. You, you die. I was just thinking that. I <laughs> was you like, have to oh be in bed God. by eight. Uh, you would die. I would never make it. Mm-hmm. Oh. So, and the longest day of the year was just 10 days away. So while it would have been kind of dark by the time Ramona arrived in Hazleton, when she left her home in Smithers, visibility was still good. Ramona stopped by to speak to a few of the neighbors. And then after that, she simply vanished into that inky blue twilight, never to be seen. Mm. When Ramona failed to show up at the dance, her best friend Crystal thought maybe she stopped at Morristown to visit her boyfriend. And this was before the age of cell phones, of course. So there was really no way to let people know if you changed plans or if an emergency had popped up. The next day, Ramona's boyfriend called to speak with her, and Ramona's mother informed him that she'd just spend the night with Crystal. So what did he do? He promptly called Crystal's house, and Crystal told him that Ramona never had shown up at the dance. She just assumed that Ramona was with him. Mm. Now, sources differ on when Matilda, her mother, called the Royal Canadian Mountain Police, or the RCMP. Some say it was as soon as she learned that Ramona was not at Crystal's or her boyfriend's house. And others say it was the following day when Ramona didn't show up for her job or for school. Either way, when Matilda did call to report her daughter missing, what happened? Mm, I'm going to say, hmm, did she run away? Ding, 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 ding. She's probably blowing off steam. She'll be home soon. Just give it some time. You know, the old standby. Mm. Which you can't blame them, but then you can kind of blame them. Well, you know what I'm to, saying? You also have Let's to consider. Err on the side of yeah. uh, caution. Mm-hmm. Caution? Yeah. Plus, you got to take into consideration where she disappeared from. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. In the meantime, Ramona's bank account was not accessed and nothing was missing from her home to indicate that she had planned on spending time away. In fact, her last paycheck hadn't even been cashed. The family coordinated their own search, but turned up nothing. About a week later, the RCMP became active in looking for Ramona. The family also received help from the Missing Children's Society of Canada. They assisted with searches and contributed to reward money. Seven months went by with no leads and no information. The Wilson family set up an account for donations to help with searches and to make and distribute missing posters, but the money barely trickled in. Her mother produced handmade dream catchers and earrings to sell, but that effort only raised $500. It was in January of 1995 that the police would get an anonymous tip that Ramona Wilson's body would be found in the woods by the airport in the Lake Catherine vicinity. So the police went up and they searched the area but found absolutely nothing. A few more months went by, and on April 9th, 1995, two teenagers were four-wheeling in a clearing north of the Smithers Airport runway near Yelich Road, and while searching for a log to help get their vehicle unstuck in the mud, they stumbled upon the decomposed remains of Ramona Wilson near the wood line. It was in the exact vicinity that the anonymous tip said that she would be found the spot where the police had searched just a few months prior. Very strange. At the scene of the crime, investigators discovered Ramona's clothing neatly folded a few feet away, except her shoes. They've never been found. The police were quoted in the Terrence Standard newspaper as saying they have, quote, little doubt that the murder of Ramona Wilson was sexually motivated. 
RCMP Corporal Rob Polson said that there was circumstantial evidence to indicate that Ramona died where her remains were found. However, no cause of death has been made public, nor has any of this circumstantial evidence. The police followed up on more than 60 tips in the weeks after her remains were discovered. The murder scene was grid-searched with the help of two forensic anthropologists, and then they swept an even wider area for additional evidence. Other objects found nearby included a half-buried small section of rope, three interlocking nylon ties, and a small pink brass knuckle-type water pistol. Do you know what I'm talking about, the, the brass knuckle-type water pistols? Yeah, like from when chance. you're a little kid? Right, we, we and play. they had the three rings to put yeah. your fingers in yeah. to grab on the handle. Okay, yeah. just wanted to make sure people... Yes. Because I was talking with my husband about this, and he's like, what? Yeah, he didn't remember that? We had water gun fights? Uh, he he hmm. did, but I'm sure it wasn't anything like that. Yeah, wasn't as cool as ours. No, nothing is. Later in October of 1995, the police took the step of searching a house in Telqua. Items were removed from the house, and the vehicle was also seized as part of the investigation. But again, no information has been released on what, if anything, was discovered pertaining to the case of Ramona Wilson. The police continued to follow up on all leads that came in, including rumors of her attending a party at the rugby fields, um, an altercation with a group of local men in a truck, and visits to unknown apartment complexes on the night of her death. None of those leads led to any arrests. And of course, controversy was not far behind the announcement of Ramona's body being discovered. The Missing Children's Society of Canada denied the reward money to the two young men who found Ramona's remains, stating that the reward was not for people who, quote, get lucky. Get lucky, meaning get lucky to to find find the body? Yeah, the (sighs) poor choice of words, but um, I don't think it's, yeah. Hmm, okay. Yeah, at first the society had said that instead of giving the money to people who found the remains, they would convert the money into a reward for finding Ramona's killer. And when the society received bad press and was sued by the two bikers who found Ramona, the Missing Children's Society changed its mind. They were going to offer reward money for finding her remains? They just offered reward for finding Ramona. I thought it would be information to, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think that's weird. Is that weird? That's probably how it should have been. There you go. Okay. Information leading to the... But it didn't. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But instead they, quote, got lucky and discovered a body, which I would think would be so traumatizing. I wouldn't consider lucky the correct word. No. (laughs) Me either. Okay. And it wasn't long before accusations of neglect and indifference toward Ramona's disappearance and murder were made against the RCMP and the general public. Um, It's the Wilson's family opinion that Ramona's disappearance and murder were not given the same amount of energy and resources of those given to non-Indigenous victims. Matilda and Brenda, who is Ramona's sister, both cite instances where they were treated with indifference while missing or murdered white women's cases were given many more resources and news coverage. In Canada, Indigenous women make up only 4% of the population, but represent 16% of all female homicides. And this is a mouthful, so get with, you know, from us. I'm going to sit up for this. Okay, go ahead. Because I wanted to make sure that I gave claim to where I found this and where Loretta found this. It's from the Statistic Canada website in an article published of April of 2022 by Luana Hedinger from Canadian Center for Justice and Community Safety Statistics showed that Indigenous women were almost six times as likely to die by homicide than other women. Carolyn Bennett, the Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs, met with Indigenous families and survivors who complained of racism and sexism by the police, who she said treated the deaths of Indigenous women as inevitable. Ms. Bennett stated that there was an uneven application of justice and that law enforcement was more likely to assume the death of a Native woman. Uh, The death was caused by a drug overdose, an accident, or suicide, and just they don't even bother to investigate it. It's awful. Uh, Whether or not it is an intentional oversight of the police and media is cause for debate since this type of racism is something most people don't realize that they're even engaged in. For example... 
in a 48 Hours episode in 2012, it was immediately evident that the Highway of Tears episode fell into that category of racial indifference. The episode devoted more than half of its runtime to two white females, one who was missing and one that was murdered. What? Ramona Wilson. <laughs> yeah, it's it's something. Let me tell you. Ramona Wilson was named specifically for a few minutes with like 10 minutes left at the end of the episode. It was just like a blip. Seriously, there wasn't much to it. And I had to go back and rewatch it to make sure I didn't miss anything because it was just a little bit. They take Matilda out to where they found Ramona's body and they talk to her for a little bit. And then that's really it. Insane. You know? Hmm. But it's just, it was strange. Looking at it through that eye, those eyes of... Yeah. Perhaps the most telling part is the fact that most of the victims of the Highway of Tears are from the First Nations, and yet no mention of it was made in that episode, nor were there statistics showcasing violence against Indigenous women. Was it deliberate or was it unintentional? Either way, the outcome is the same, that there is an uneven application of justice. Totally. And I was trying to think of, it's 2011, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So it's not like... 2012. They... It was on 2012. <sighs> okay. Hmm. Yeah. A family's socioeconomic status also helps to bring attention to their missing or murdered loved ones. Families with more money can afford to take time off from work to devote themselves to their loved ones' cases. Likewise, a family with a reserve of cash can afford to pay for missing posters, special searches, and to travel to make press appearances. People with money also tend to have connections to people of standing within the community who can lend assistance and to help get the word out. Overall, the poverty rate in Canada went down from 14.5% to 11% last year, but a study concluded that marginalized groups experienced disproportionately higher levels of poverty. This means that they have fewer resources to devote to their missing or murdered family members. Mm. Four years before Ramona Wilson went missing, another girl, Delphine Nical, Nical, went missing from Smithers. On June 13th, 1990, 15-year-old Delphine telephoned her family from Smithers to say she was hitchhiking the nine miles home to the town of Telqua. Earlier in the day, she had successfully hitchhiked to Smithers to meet up with her friends. However, on her return trip, she wouldn't be so lucky. Delphine was never seen again, and to make matters worse, Delphine was not the first of her family to vanish without a trace. Tragedy had struck just eight months earlier when Delphine's cousin, Cecilia, went missing from Vancouver in October of 1989. And yet another cousin, Roberta Nicole, went missing from Surrey in British Columbia. Neither Roberta nor Cecilia disappeared on Highway 16. But it seems worth mentioning to highlight just how prevalent this problem is among Indigenous families. No trace of either girl has ever been found. In your family? You know what I mean? No. Like, that's three unheard three. of. That's shocking. Judy Nical, Delphine's mother, said in an interview that Delphine was the only one of her five children who regularly visited her when she was in the hospital. Judy had been a victim of a botched stomach surgery in 1988 and spent four months in a coma. Delphine would make the four hour trek to Prince George every two weeks to be with her mother. Judy said her visits helped make her stronger. Desperate to find any information on what happened to her daughter, Judy enlisted the help of a psychic from Louisiana who visited visited Smithers for almost a week and declared that Delphine had been kidnapped and was somewhere near a river. Several years ago, the family filled out official paperwork to legally pronounce Delphine dead. Quote, it's too painful to let go, her sister said. The family has not held a memorial service for Delphine as of yet because they say there are just too many unanswered questions. In 1994, the officer assigned to both cases said that he wasn't sure that the murder of Ramona Wilson and the disappearance of Delphine Nicole were connected. However, many speculate that the cases of Ramona and Delphine, combined with three other indigenous teenage girls who disappeared shortly after Ramona, their names are Leanna Derrick, Alicia Germain, and Roxanne Thiera may all be the work of the same killer. In a 2012 interview, Sergeant Wayne Cleary said, quote, I've uncovered men who drive vans with door handles removed from the inside, duct tape, plastic restraints, trap doors. 
Oh. It's incredible to me how many men are capable of doing this. That's disturbing. Very disturbing. Can't they be arrested and at least the car searched? I I guess. I'm assuming the car has been searched. Ugh. Now, I will say that, that was from um, a 40, the 48 Hours episode. Um, and they went to the evidence room and where they store everything that's related to the Highway of Tears. Mm-hmm. And this was in 2012, by the way. That was just 10 years ago. So I'm sure there's more now. But there were over 750 boxes, each containing transcribed cases, forensic reports, lab reports, interviews. They had 60,000 interviews of people and 1,400 people of interests. Wow. Wow. Mm. Seriously. And he also, um, it was also mentioned on that 48 Hours episode that the Highway of Tears goes through what seems to be an endless forest, and it's perfect for a murderer to find victims. Well, and if they know, if they're, if they're a trucker and they do that route often, they know that. Mm-hmm. And if they're a local, they know that. Right. So it and would be... Sergeant, Cl- Sergeant Clary also, once it said that it's perfect for murder to find victims, Sergeant Clary added that it's also the perfect dumping ground because of how vast mm-hmm. and the woods Well, how could you even everything. search that? You yeah, wouldn't have the resources to search all that. In 2005, a special task force was created called EPANA for the purpose of solving cases of missing and murdered persons along this specific section of Highway of Tears. Uh, It got the name from Pana, which is an Inuit goddess who cares for souls before they are reincarnated and sent back to Earth. And the letter E is the RCMP group that has jurisdiction over the British Columbia. So at first, the goal was to determine if a serial killer was responsible for the deaths and disappearances of 18 women whose cases fell within specific parameters. Now, the victims involved in the EPAN investigation followed the criteria of being female, participating in high-risk activities such as hitchhiking or sex work. I'm not saying that any of these women are in sex work. I'm just saying that's part Mm -hmm. of the parameters. Mm -hmm. It also includes where they were last seen and whether there's evidence of being attacked by another person or if their bodies were discovered within a mile of Highway 16. Within a year of the formation of the Special Task Force, it expanded to include victims along Highways 5, 24, and 97, and it's no longer specifically dedicated to the Highway of Tears cases. Nobody is certain how many people have gone missing or murdered along that 550-mile corridor of Highway 16, especially since violent acts against women and sometimes even disappearances go unreported. For example, the aunt of missing victim uh, Tamara Chipman had been raped by a truck driver who picked her up along Highway 16. She never reported it because she figured her claim wouldn't be taken seriously, which is heartbreaking. Another woman was raped twice and abducted once but escaped, never reporting any of the three incidences. And she still hitchhikes. Many of these, they don't, a lot of people don't have the choice. They They just don't have cars. They they can't afford the buses. The transportation's not available. Like you saw with Smithers, how a bus came like twice a week or something Mm -hmm. like that. I mean, it's. Yeah. And if they have to go somewhere. If they need to go somewhere, they have to go somewhere. I think maybe they should form a group and get one car between like 20 of them and share. I'd help support that. Many of these indigenous individuals were the product of the residential school system, and we all know how that goes. Ramona's mother is among them. Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their families for long periods of time and were forcibly indoctrinated into Euro, Canadian, and Christian ways of living and assimilating into mainstream white Canadian society thereby erasing all of their cultural identity. Many were abused both physically and sexually, 
leaving them with nothing but shame, anger, and PTSD. Hitchhiking hardly seems all that dangerous by comparison. Some lists of Highway of Tears victims include murders in St. George's City. Some lists include cases that don't occur along Highway 16 at all. And some include domestic murders and non-stranger killings. Sadly, a disproportionate number of them have been indigenous to First Nation women, and most cases remain unsolved. Matilda Wilson said that the RCMP's handling of these cases since the organization of Ipana has greatly improved. Wilson also praised the RCMP, and Sergeant Clary particularly, for keeping her and her family informed on new developments. However, some still express resentment that it took 36 years and the case of Nicole Hoare to finally get resources and attention they needed. Nicole Hoare, a white woman who went missing while hitchhiking on the way to Smithers from Prince George in 2002, got nationwide coverage. Hers was the first Highway of Tears cases to be covered by the Vancouver Sun, the Globe, and Mail, and the Edmonton Journal. Her disappearance brought the Highway of Tears sharply into focus. One only needs to take a cursory look at newspapers from that time to see that Nicole Hoare's disappearance resulted in not, not only ground search and rescue, but also aerial searches using helicopters and two airplanes. Somebody even donated a duplex property for the family to use as ground zero, like a command center, mm -hmm. and a $25,000 reward was posted for information leading to her whereabouts. An Olympic speed skater who had gone to high school with Nicole had skated at the Olympic Oval to raise money for the family, and credit unions across Canada were prepared to take donations. By contrast, Ramona Wilson and others got no aerial search, virtually no ground search, no command center, and no sports star to aid in raising money. Um, just remember that Ramona's mom spent months creating handmade earrings and dream catchers only to raise $500. Hmm. Matilda Wilson is quick to point out that she's happy that such extensive efforts to find Nicole were made. She only wished the same was done for all the missing girls. And when she heard of Nicole's disappearance, her first thought was, quote, oh, no, not another one. But then she also quickly thought, well, maybe now there'll be more attention for all the girls. And you know what? She was right. This year, 2022, Ramona's family held the 28th annual Ramona Wilson Walk on Saturday, June 11th, to honor her and others who had gone missing or have been found murdered on Highway 16. The walk started at Lake Catherine Elementary School and ended at Yelich Road, which is the road where Ramona's body was found. They do this on the anniversary of her death every year, hoping the exposure will inspire somebody to come forth with new information about who's responsible for Ramona's death. Whoever made the initial anonymous call to the police stating where Ramona's body could be found, which turned out to be true, obviously had good information, and the RCMP urges that person to call again. I mean, seriously. They know. How, how did they know where the body would be found? And what else do they know? You know, they mm -hmm. could totally be the hero mm -hmm. that solves Ramona's case. Totally be the hero. And who doesn't want to be a hero, right? Mm -hmm. Matilda Wilson has often entertained the idea that her daughter was accidentally struck by a drunk driver who panicked and hit her body. And as a mother, that would be preferable <laughs> to think that way. You know? I agree. I agree. However, the investigators strongly believe that Ramona's murder was sexually motivated. And, you know, you can't really forget that her clothes was found piled neatly just a few mm -hmm. feet away. That doesn't indicate that she was hit. You know, maybe a small amount of remorse, but, you know, I don't know. At any rate, Matilda also believes that it was a local person who's responsible for Ramona's death. The horse trails behind the airport where Ramona's body was found aren't easy to navigate for an outsider. And more importantly, they're not even visible from the highway. The case of 12-year-old Monica Jack, the youngest of all the victims who went missing off Highway 5, is the only solved Ipana case. None of Ipana's cases that directly involved Highway 16 have ever been solved. Some cases don't fall within the Ipana perimeters, but are still considered Highway of Cheers murders, and they've been solved. Just to name a few, Cody Legibikoff was caught fleeing from the scene covered in blood, and he was stopped by police. I mm. think I might do one of the 12 Nightmares Before Christmas about him. Mm. Edward Dennis Isaac was brought to justice because his girlfriend went to the police to tell them that he'd forced her to dispose of bodies. 
Bodies, plural. Bodies, uh uh-huh. Bobby Jack Fowler, a transient worker from the United States, was also caught fleeing the scene of kidnapping and attempted rape. Later, he was connected to three murders through DNA. And in 1969, he had been charged with murdering a man and woman in Texas, but was only convicted of discharging a firearm within the city limits. Some suspect him of killing at least 10 of the Highway of Tears murders, some say 20. Um, But we're quickly reminded that he was incarcerated in 1996 and couldn't have been responsible for any murders after that date. And Dr. Kim Rosmo, a leading profile criminologist, is on record as saying that, in his opinion, Fowler is not responsible for any of the deaths along Highway 16 between 1989 and 2006. Brian Peter Arp was convicted of two of the murders using advanced DNA technology. Gary Taylor Handlin, who had been a person of interest in the Mona Jack case, confessed to killing the 12-year-old during an elaborate police sting known as Mr. Big Undercover Operation. Other than the case of Gary Handlin, two of the killers were caught in the act and two were connected with DNA. If there are no suspects, DNA will not help. And quite often, the bodies recovered have been out in the elements for months to years, and any evidence, fibers, prints, and DNA have long ago been washed away. That's a lot of people. Oof. <laughs> and yeah, like a 450-mile road. And that's just... The ones we know of. The tip. Exactly. Oof. RCMP Sergeant Wayne Clary said they may never solve all the cases and that it'll be the, quote, people in the communities that are going to solve these crimes. In other words, it's the people who saw something or know something, or maybe somebody kind of confesses on their deathbed. It's that kind of confession that will bring closure to these families. But as we know, controversy is never far away from the Highway of Tears murders. In November of 2014, the new Democratic Party made a freedom of information request seeking all government files pertaining to two missing women of the Highway of Tears. The government of British Columbia stated that the FOI request produced no files relating to the Highway of Tears. And it seems as though they'd all been deleted. On October 22, 2015, Elizabeth Denham, the Information of Privacy Commissioner of British Columbia, published a 65-page report outlining how BC government officials had, quote, Triple deleted emails relating to the Highway of Tears. Not sure what triple deleted means, but it sounds bad. It's no wonder how people like Matilda Wilson could lose faith in the system. Seriously. I mean, come on. Efforts have been made to improve safety along Highway 16, but with such a large distance between settlements and a lack of public transportation, and more importantly, the lack of jobs in the area and the lack of car ownership among the disenfranchised, Hitchhiking still continues. Matilda Wilson still fights for justice to be done in her daughter's case. Ramona's sister, Brenda, spiraled into alcoholism after the abduction and murder of her sister. But after a lot of soul searching, she got sober. She served as the coordinator of the Highway of Tears Initiative, which is run by Carrier Seikani Family Services. It's an arm of Carrier Seikani Tribal Council, which is a First Nation. Um, a local First Nation. She speaks of the importance of the individual. Lumping these cases as the highway of tears murder takes individuality away from each victim. She said in an interview, quote, some of the names are already forgotten because the families aren't able to vocalize. They don't have that skill at this time. And they're still feeling deeply due to grief and it's hard to talk about. So to honor Brenda's wish of acknowledging the individuals. These are the women on Ipana's list of victim from 1969 to the present. Gloria Moody, Michelle Perret, Gail Ways, Pamela Darlington, Monica Ignas, Colleen McMillan, Monica Jack, Maureen Mosey, Shelley Ann Basu, Alberta Williams, Delphine Nical, Roxanne Thiera, Alicia Germain, Lana Derrick, Nicole Hoare, Tamara Chipman, Aaliyah Sarek Auger, and of course, Ramona Lisa Wilson. 
Now, there's very little information about these women, which available online. And there are so many more women that have gone missing or have found murdered in the infamous Highway of Tears. So, if you know anything about the disappearance or murder of any of these women, please contact the British Columbia Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. Now, this is probably where I'm going to cry. Don't so. cry. Don't cry. You're doing good. <clears throat> You're doing good. Just way Rem- too many. Way too many. So, Ramona never got to fulfill her dreams of going to university to become a psychologist. And the number of human beings that she could have helped will never be known. But what is known is that she's still missed, loved, and honored by her family to this day. Look at me. I'm crying. It's terrible. Um, but we do know that Ramona was a poet. So here are a few words of this sweet 16-year-old girl on the verge of discovering the world and contributing so many good things to the human race. Uh, make me cry. As I look out to the bright blue sky this chilly autumn day, there's no way I can thank the creator, no way to repay. For the lovely sights to heart's content that he has let me see, for joys and laughter that I have lived, and the love that he gave me. That's it. <sighs> wow. Uh, really? Way too many victims. Puts that heart in my throat right there. I don't. <clears throat> yeah. It's just too seriously. many. I, it's too it's many. too many. And you should see the evidence room on that 20, on that 48 hours. I mean, it's just, and I'm sure the shot was done so you can, mm-hmm. it gets you. Well, and how, how do so I? so many, 750 boxes and that was 10 years ago. How many more do you think they've put on the shelf? Well, 60,000 interviews of people and still most of these murders remain unsolved. Mm-hmm. And they don't know how many people are missing from that highway. Mm-hmm. People go on vacation up there. Yeah. Are they, you know, I don't know. And I hate to say it, but if you were a predator. Oh, yeah. That's, you know, you want to do evil by somebody. There's there's a, yes, exactly. It's terrible. That was a good, that you told that story nicely. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I don't think we can really. It's hard to come back from that, isn't it? Yeah. Really follow up with the. Anything yeah. to say, uh, yeah. Well, I hope if somebody knows anything, they reach out to them. Um, I I'll do post think the phone number and everything yeah. in the show notes. To I think too, a lot call. of people might see things and not think anything about it, not realizing well, right. what's taking place. You and know? not all people that pick up hitchhikers or truckers are evil or bad. I mean, we just can't say that. No, well, they're not. No, but it's. That's just a it's lot. so dangerous. And I get why they have to do it. I totally do. That's why I said I think totally they all need understand to pull their resources and get a hoopty and just share it around town. Yeah. Sign up for days that you need it or something. I don't know. It's terrible. Well, you did a good job, Jen. Thanks. Do, do we have any promos this week? Uh, promos will be in the very front of the okay. show. And I believe it's by one of our friend Mike Morford. One of his podcasts Oof. by the Abject Podcasts. Okay. He always puts out good quality entertainment. Yes, he does. All right, Jen. I guess uh, until next time, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye-bye. Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Jen. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at WeTalkOfDreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. 
we would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash our true crime podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya.